You're listening to The Safety and the Sports Writer on Northeast Streaming Sports. Good morning, everybody. We are back on the 15th of March, getting ready for a spectacular start to the uh, NCAA tournament after some nice conference tournament action this weekend. Uh, we got a lot, we got some, and Nate's we're getting ready to talk about the free agent happenings in the NFL, which started today. Um, they can't officially be signed, I guess, till, till what? Tomorrow. When? Tomorrow, but tomorrow at four anyway. o'clock. Yeah, it's basically being done today. But anyway, we got that to go over. And at 7.30, we have former Ohio State standout quarterback Steve Belisari going to talk, come in and talk to us about quarterbacks and, you know, what it mean, what it's like being a quarterback at a major university, plus what he thinks about all the goings on in the NFL and what's going on with the quarterback position now compared to when he was in school or when he was at Ohio State uh, about a decade ago. So we're going to we're really excited to get him on tonight. And uh, I guess we'll just start out right with the NFL and the free agents. Uh, and you know, you, you were just spouting off a few of the big signings. Let's go over it. What you what you've been seeing? Yeah, I'd say today's uh, biggest winners so far, uh, as far as the announcements go, it has to be the Patriots. I mean, uh, you know, they they signed Cam a couple of days ago to another year. Does that is that going to you know shake up the league? Probably not. But it gives them a guy who's won an NFL MVP on their roster. I think they still go out and either get a veteran or draft somebody uh, to come in and either, you know, win the job from Cam or compete with them. And then today um, they signed three big time players. They signed uh, tight end Johnu Smith from the Titans uh, for over $40 million, which I think is an amazing move for them because they have not had a tight end since Gronk left. Um, and then they also signed um, Matt Judon. Uh, outside linebacker, pass rusher from the Ravens, who I think is a pretty stellar uh, addition to their defense, especially with all the guys coming back uh, from the opt-out. And uh, and then they also signed uh, defensive back Jalen Mills, uh, who helped the uh, Philadelphia Eagles uh, win the Super Bowl, the Green Goblin. Um, you know, whether you think, whether you like him or not, the guy's been played in some big-time playoff games and uh, won it all. So, uh, you know, I think the Patriots are, are, are making moves. They've got money to spend and I think they're spending it wisely. Uh, what do you think? Well, I mean, I, I would never dispute, um, you know, the coach and when, when it comes to talent at different positions, I, I'm kind of questioning the cam move. I mean, it was yeah. an experiment that I, I, maybe with another year of working with them, maybe they can come up with something that can, you know, a way to, to bridge, their way of doing things with his whatever skills he has left. I mean, he did win. They did win seven games with him. We're close to the playoffs. But I I still tend to wonder, is, is he going to get better next year than he was this year? And obviously, the Stidham experiment is over with. He, they, yeah. he's, if he, he's not – he's never going to be there. Um, the, the Hail Mary pass of maybe bringing back a Garoppolo, not going to happen. Um, I mean, what you talk about, I think they should, and I was, I think you mentioned this and I was kind of threw it out under the bus, but, um, if you're going to go with cam, it would not be a bad idea to bring in uh, Fitzpatrick. Yeah. You know, you got, you got two veteran quarterbacks there. I mean, um, a guy who's been around the league knows how to win between the two of them, you know, maybe you get a full season, you know, you know, and you know whoever's hot, you ride the hot hand. Um, well, you could still draft somebody. They have the number fifteen pick in the draft. One of those quarterbacks is going to be there: Mac Jones, Kyle Trask. You know uh, the, the the dude from uh, BYU, the the guy from uh, North, you know Lance uh, from North Dakota. I mean, the, the, one of those guys will be there. I don't know who they like, but they have the opportunity to draft somebody and get both those guys. I don't know whether they'll do all three of those things, but that's what I would do. Yeah, if you can, if you can manage, to, if there's someone there to grab, you grab them. Um, but I, I think it, what they what they've been showing right now is they're serious about competing, and they understand that Buffalo is way ahead, Miami's right is ahead of them right now, and uh, they can't take any and they can't take any chances. They're going to have to stay, you know, stock the cupboard up and, and be able to go toe to toe with these guys. So, yeah, I mean, uh, overall, like I said, the cam kind of mystified me. But if he's cheap and they can afford to get another veteran quarterback under under the cap with him, okay, I'll deal with that. 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's, I don't think that that's, if they just have cam and they do nothing else, I think it's a bad idea, but for the money that they signed him for, I think yeah. he's motivated. I think Belichick likes his work at thick. He said he was the first guy in and the last one out the entire season. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe they'll see if he's another year removed from the injuries, if he can, uh, you know, step it up a notch, but I don't think they're just going to leave it up to cam and uh, not bring somebody in to compete with them because I, I think they are going to. Um, you know, Belichick, I was, I'll, I'll say one thing. I think all these guys know when they come to the Patriots, you can't, you can't, you know, F around. I mean, even Randy Moss was, 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 you know, but no problem. He was up there. Uh, I mean, yeah, of course, you have the Aaron Hernandez incident you can point to. You got a few other things um, that maybe, but for the most part, these guys know. When they end up in Foxborough, um, Belichick won't won't hesitate to cut him if he thinks they're going to get in the way of what he wants to do. So, uh, I, I definitely think that Cam knew he once he got there he had to put in the extra time. I don't I don't know you know, but it's hard for me to say because I don't know maybe Cam was like that in Carolina too. We don't know. I mean, Carolina was is so far off of everybody's radar that. You know, no one even cares what goes on there in the off season. But where the under in New England, you're under a microscope. So, yeah, I think he worked hard when he was in Carolina. I mean, obviously, um, you know, Chico loved him and and think speaks very highly of him. And they went to a Super Bowl. I mean, he won the MVP. It's not like he was a slouch. No. Um, and and he worked really hard. Um, but you know, uh, you know, there's other moves being made. I really liked the uh, 49ers re-signing Jason Barrett. Um, you know, they took a chance on him uh, coming from the Chargers when he had all those injuries and they hung with him and he, he it, it paid off. He produced. He had a tremendous season two years ago and played really well last year. And they're getting him um, for one year, five point five million with incentives. So uh, that's really good for a starting corner. And then um, I liked the Browns uh, signing safety John Johnson um, out of, uh, from the Rams. I mean, that's something me and you talked about weeks ago with the Rams cap issues. There's going to be a lot of guys getting let go from there. And a lot of the guys not being able to be re-signed. I expect, um, Leonard Floyd to be signed elsewhere. I expect some of their receivers to either be cut, uh, or, you know, the, the ones that are free agents to be signed elsewhere. Cause they don't have any money. Uh, they got all their money wrapped up in, in five guys. And that's a big problem. And uh, I think this signing of Johnson with the Browns uh, shows you that right away because he, he he's played pretty well. And I think the the signing out in Oak or in Oakland in Las Vegas of uh, Indagwe or I can't I never say his name right, but um, shows that uh, John Gruden was paying attention to the Super Bowl. He knows how important it is. If he's going to get over that hump against Kansas City, he's got to have a pass rush. Yeah, he's and Indagwe, really you know. Rush. He's got some miles on him, and at times, um, you know, it showed uh, with the Ravens. Uh, but when he was healthy, he made a difference out there, and he still was able to make plays. So I think um, with all the the problems that the Raiders' defense has seen, they need to get everyone they can. And I, I think uh, getting Addie and Dockway is a good idea. Um, and definitely a step in the right direction. But they got a lot more work to do. Well, they, you know, like I said, the, the way they that Tampa Bay showed <clears throat> the kryptonite of Pat Mahomes is the same kryptonite of every uh, quarterback, it seems, which is get a good pass rush, make it so he can't escape, and just keep coming at him all night long so he doesn't have the time to find those extra guys downfield. So, and it, speaking, and speaking of the Buccaneers, um, you know, and you're talking about showing the <laughs> pass rush, uh, defensive end Shaq Barrett. Uh, he signed a four-year deal, four-year extension worth seventy-two million dollars. So um, they're going to be keeping—they're uh, keeping pretty much everybody in house, which I, I didn't think they would be able to do. Uh, but they've gotten creative uh, with their finance—you know, financing, uh, financing. If I can say it, uh, they got really creative with it, and they've been able to retain pretty much everybody. You know, they added Godwin. Uh, put him on the tag, and and now they're bringing back Barrett, and they signed a extension with Levante David. Uh, they're they're keeping everybody um, on the squad. Oh yeah, camp camp happy down in Tampa Bay. <laughs> 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 it's like 
You know, it's like I don't care. I, I you know, it's uh, it's great. They won. I get it. They they won. They're happy with it. But all this kumbaya stuff. Oh my god! I'm just like, okay, all right, all right. A little bit, a little bit less, less of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they did get some good news, and maybe they didn't even have to spend as much money as they did when Drew Brees decided to finally announce his retirement. Something everybody knew was pretty much coming. It was it was written in not written in stone, but it's close to written in stone. Um, you know when you. you Two things. First of all, before we get into his replacement, uh, I remember Drew Brees back when he played for Purdue and Joe Tiller, and he was the guy who put that university back on the map, him and Joe Tiller together, and it was a great you know, three-year run with those two together. And I always was a Drew Brees fan. I mean, I love the way he played quarterback position. Um, I don't know what San Diego didn't see in him, but it was a perfect situation that they gave up on him and he was able to go and – become uh, Sean Payton's dream quarterback for over a decade of, of fantastic play. And as somebody who always felt sorry for the Saints, um, you know, when I was growing up, I, I saw Archie Manning suffer down there. I saw him get his ass kicked week in and week out, even though he was as good as most quarterbacks in the NFL, if not better than a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL. I mean, I, I have always said, you put him on the Rams, they might have made it to a Super Bowl. I mean, there, there was I mean, there was no way he wasn't better than Pat Hayden, you know. And in, in, in Washington, had Billy Kilmer and and Sonny and uh, and uh, Jurgensen, who were over the hill and done. Uh, the Chicago Bears had Bob Avellini, who was one of the worst quarterbacks ever in football history. And you know, poor Walter Payton was getting picked apart. I mean, he could have improved so many teams, and the Saints in that that city had to suffer together until. Finally, Sean Payton and Drew Brees got there. So, you know, kudos to them and what they did for the city. Now, um, from what I read today, Sean Payton's really he wants to re-sign Jameis Winston. I don't see it. You you are big, bigger on him than me. Um, well, I, maybe- I, see the, I see the potential. I mean, I don't think Jameis Winston's a bona fide, um, you know, franchise quarterback yet. But if you can get him on a, a short-term deal and make him earn it, um, you know, I think you've had him on your system for a year. I think it's a good idea for them to bring him in. And then you've still got Taysom Hill who restructured his contract. And if Jameis doesn't work out, then you throw Taysom out there and you roll with him. But they don't have the money to sign anybody. Who are they going to sign? They don't have the money to sign anyone else. There was a, there was a, there was a, there was a hockey coach locally who uh, I used to cover a lot. And he used to call his problem children, children chuckleheads. And that's what I think is Jameis Winston. He has all the talent in the world, but I, I just think he has a maturity problem. I think he's a chucklehead. I think he's the kind of guy who uh, can't get in. You can't won't get any consistency out of him. You won't. He doesn't understand. You know, there 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 are, there are great athletes out there in all sports who you just they just don't understand the gifts they've been given, and those gifts don't last forever. You know what I mean? It eventually, with, with Cam going through, even if Jameis Winston starts putting something together now, in seven years, he's going to be Cam Newton or Eli Manning or any of these quarterbacks that get old. I mean, eventually it happens to all of them. So you can't afford to waste the time when you're 21, 22, 23, 24 years old, and you've got all your physical skills. You know, you got to get in there and get it, get the job done. And I, I – I just don't see it in James Winston's yeah, demeanor. He definitely or, has I the talent. I mean, he, he's he won a national championship at right, yeah, State. Yeah, he won, won a Heisman great, Trophy, he, he, and he then, then he a, threw for 5,000 yards in the NFL. So you can't tell me that he doesn't have the ability to do it. Um, and I think this is a real wake-up call for him, man. I mean, he was basically let go um, and just, you know, an afterthought for the Buccaneers. I mean, I don't care who you are. If you are a competitor of any kind, which he was a major league baseball um, drafted baseball player, and then he was also drafted number one we overall in the NFL. We we don't know if he was a competitor. That's the question about him. We he don't won a know. national championship. You can't he win a, a national championship team. without he being a, a great team. He didn't do it by himself. <laughs> yeah, I know he didn't do it by himself, but he was the quarterback. Yeah, but I'm still saying, I mean – it, it, I, to go back over that Florida State t- the year, we'd have to look at every game and, and break it down and say, was it because of him? Was it not because of him? Was he riding along? I mean, we both know that there have been quarterbacks that have been along for the ride 
to national championships. He was not along for the ride. You didn't watch that season very closely, obviously. He was a legit – he won the Heisman Trophy. I mean, he was a good, good college quarterback. I'm not saying he'll be great in the NFL. He hasn't been so yeah, far. We don't – we don't – We first of all, he only played, what, two years? One like year? Two years. Two years. Two years. I mean, we, we didn't see the full the full effect of, of – I'm not going to put him as the greatest core of one of the great college quarterbacks of all time. I'm not going to put him in the Marino class who did it for four years and those guys that stuck around and, and did it for four years. But I mean, yeah, he won a national championship, but so did Matt Leiner. Yeah. And Matt Leiner never panned, panned out in the pros. Yeah. And Matt Leiner never threw for 5,000 yards either. So we'll see what he happens. Didn't have to. Man, I, I, running back running for three for 2,000 yards apiece. He didn't have to. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he, if he wanted to, he could have. Yeah, Matt Leinart sucked and showed no promise, and that's why he's out of the league quick. Well, Jameis may be too, and Jameis may be too, but they're they're going to give him a shot, man. I'm telling you, the Saints are going to sign him. That's, that's what he says. He's going to give him a shot. I just I don't see it. And you know, if I if I was as smart as Sean Payton, I wouldn't be here with you on here. I'd be coaching somewhere. So I'm yeah. not saying I know everything, but in in my personal opinion and, and watching what I've seen of him is. He remind you know there were for years everybody thought Vinny Testaverde he's got that arm he's that guy and every every coach who tried to and only one coach Parcells was able to turn him for one year into that style of quarterback that could lead you to a championship. He played Just, pretty well for the Jets, you know, for seven one year. years. No, he, he played did. pretty good for a couple of years, man. And then he played. Don't, he don't, played you, remember, don't you don't you remember when you, who, who was the coach who, who followed Parcells? But anyways, it was the last game of the year, and Testaverde threw like three first half interceptions. The coach went up to him and goes, "You got us in this problem. You better get the hell get us out of it." The yeah. man was an interception waiting to happen. Same thing with Jameis. It, we'll see, buddy. I, I he that has been his issue, but they they have no money. They they're they're cutting players, not signing players right now. I know. I mean, they're having to get rid of everyone. They they basically couldn't bring Drew Brees back, even if they wanted to. That's why he's <laughs> retiring, and so they had to do something. And with the cap issues that they've got, they got to go with Taysom Hill, and they the, Jameis is probably the only dude they can afford. So I take a guy that's thrown for five grand and thirty touchdowns and see if you can coach the uh you know the interceptions out of him i mean that's what sean payton's supposed to be right he's yeah. supposed to be he's supposed to be a great coach he's supposed to be a super bowl winning coach so is so is arians if anyone can do it it's got to be him so we'll so see what happens but he's gonna get a shot arians was supposed to be that too so we'll see we'll see i mean i could be wrong i've been wrong before no i'm but. not saying that he's great i'm just saying that the, he's the only option they've got and um, he, he's the only guy they can afford. I mean, they can't even draft anybody because they wouldn't be able to to pay for the quarterback contract. I mean, they're they're in big time trouble. So, luckily, yeah. Taysom Hill restructured his deal because that's going to free up about eight million more bucks, um, so that they can at least that. maybe keep some of their guys and, and field a fifty three man roster. <laughs> Still not enough, and that, and that's why I'm saying with Tampa Bay is like. All this kumbaya stuff down there. I mean, they know Carolina's not a real, not a real um, threat right now. Atlanta's going through their, their. I mean, they're going to have Matt Ryan. Their rebuild is going on. So I yeah. mean, if Tampa Bay, if if Brady's healthy and they they remain basically healthy and don't get you know um, high on themselves and their success on the rubber chicken circuit and, you know, doing partying and stuff like that. If they can, if they can keep themselves hungry, they should march through that division next year because the other three teams are, are all in either full or semi rebuild mode. So it, it, the door is wide open for them. Um, well, you, you, you got any more uh, free agent stuff to get into anything with my giants? They cut Leitler, dude. Are, are the giants doing anything? Uh, they have not signed anybody of note uh, just yet. I, I'm pretty sure they put the tag on um, the uh, defensive tackle Leonard Williams, so they're yeah. at least keeping him around, uh, which I think they, they needed to do. He was a defensive anchor on the defensive line and, and kind of anchored that everything that, that they wanted to do on defense. So I think bringing him back is good, but uh, we'll see who else. They're, in, they're in not in great shape cap wise either so they're in, um, they're, in, they're in a terrible spot and you know I, I around here Gettleman gets killed and 
Yeah, I mean, I understand. He was he was he was given a bad hand coming in. You know, looking at it, um, maybe Eli could have give, done him all a favor and retired a couple of years earlier to get this thing started on the rebuild. Um, it didn't help that Saquon Barkley's second year he had he had a bad injury or a bad ankle for most of the year, and then his third year he has the knee injury, so you lose a year and a half of Saquon. Um, so his drafts don't look as good as they could have looked. Um, and it's, it's just the giants. I, I like their coaching staff, but they, they've got to get some, some kind of somehow get some players. They got to, he's got to, he's got to either have a, a, a B plus draft or better or find some cheap free agents, some guys that have been let go of other teams and, you know, can't because because of where the free, the, uh, salary cap is they can't price themselves too high or are willing to take a chance. You know what I mean? There's a lot of teams that are going to have to start rookies, not only count on rookies, but start them um, just out of necessity. So this year's draft uh, is going to be one of the most important drafts in, in recent, probably ever, because there's never been a cap situation like this since the NFL um, you know, the merge, the merger. And uh, this is going to be very interesting to see because if you if you miss on these draft picks and then you've got no one to play and you're going to have to play an undrafted free agent or some aging veteran, you could be in big time trouble. So this draft is going to be very important. And that's why I'm excited about, you know, breaking it down in the next couple of weeks because it's, it's going to be imperative that some of these guys draft well. Yeah, it, it, well, yeah, yeah, you're right. More than ever before. The only good thing you say on that, I could, you can argue to flip side of that coin and say, well, Everybody's in that boat. Yeah, everybody except the Chiefs. Everybody except the you know the Bills. Everybody except Tampa Bay. Everybody except you know the Rams. Well, the Rams are in, in hell too. But I mean, the the teams that are prepared, they could go out and win their first six games and run away and hide in their division. And you know, yeah. then you you got a bunch of people with eight and eight, nine and seven, seven and nine records, hoping to get a, a good last week on the bubble and get in. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Your boy Kevin Zeitler, he signed with the uh, Baltimore Ravens, uh, three years, uh, twenty-two point five million. Um, for them. I like Zeitler. I mean, yeah, I, he's I mean, bolstered their line, and they they need a little help um, on that offensive line, just because they were you know kind of decimated with injuries at times last year, and it, it showed. So I think adding him was a great move for them. And then uh, the 49ers brought back Kyle Uchek, um, five years, twenty-seven million. Um, which I think is a great move for them. He makes all that stuff happen in the running game. Um, he, you know, he's one of those guys. He's like that. Uh, you know, uh, Johnson, Butch Johnson used to be. He's he's one of those guys. He's he's a good receiver, good blocker, good team guy, um, and they would like to run with a fullback. So it makes all the sense in the world. That's yeah, a, that's a great pickup or a great retention for them, I should say. Yeah. Uh, go yeah. ahead. I was going to say too. We, you know, when we talked uh, to Mike Zabo, the scout for the Buffalo Bills, you know, one thing we talked about was, um, you know, bringing back Matt Milano, and uh, I, I'd stress the importance of it and ask him if he felt that way, and he agreed with me, and um, they did. They brought him back four years, forty-one million. Um, you know, a lot of money. That's a pretty good contract, four years, forty-one million. But he definitely um, took a hometown discount to come back for the Bills. Yeah, but well, you know, the whole thing is, I, I love, I, I love the guy uh, be doing that because, first of all, I think in the back of his mind, he feels uh, there's business, there's business left to be done. They didn't make the Super Bowl yet. Maybe it'd be different if he had made the Super Bowl once, but I think he, he thinks with his team and his teammates, he wants to make the Super Bowl. So yeah, we'll discount and let's face facts that discount's not that bad when you when you think about it. So. No, no, not not for a, a linebacker. Um, not gonna not have terrible, to, he's not going to have to get a part-time job at Wendy's. He's going to be okay. No, but, you know, he left <laughs> eight or nine million bucks on the table. That's for oh, sure. Oh, I give him credit for it. I, give him I think credit. so. I think it's smart. But, you know, even with the moves, with the Taysom Hill restructuring, uh, the Saints are still about eight million bucks over. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens with them. I know they're restructuring Michael Thomas's deal. And, um, you know, they're going to get Breeze off the books, but um, they're still going to have to make some moves. They cut Emmanuel Sanders also, um, who who was their, you know, number two wide receiver. A so, big pickup of, what, two years ago? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, he was supposed to be their big, uh, you know, addition because they picked him up from uh, the 49ers last year uh, to be that number two guy, and and he's gone. Sign me up to from sign me up to Sayonara. Yeah, that's in how it's going right now. <laughs> Uh, you want to, to start doing doing some break? We got, um, like we said, Steve Belisari coming up in about twenty one minutes. You want to start doing a little breakdown of the NCAA? Are you? We got some other. Yeah, other... yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the basketball. Um, we we can talk about that first off. Obviously, uh, we just talked about off air. Uh, Indiana's fired their coach again. It seems to be a pretty common theme over there in Bloomington uh, over the past twenty years or so. They. They, they, you get to coach the Hoosiers for three years, maybe four, yeah. and then you're gone. And, um, you know, me and you talked about it. They expect, I guess, to win a national championship every four years. And if you don't win one, uh, they fire your ass. And, and you know, was Archie Miller tearing it up? Uh, no, 67 and 58 in four years. That's not great. Um, but, you know, last year they were set to make the tournament and could have had a run, but the tournament was canceled. And uh, this year they had some injuries and had some problems, just like a lot of teams did, um, and, and went 15 and 12 or 12 and 15. So, you know, that's it. But now they're paying Sean, uh, Archie, Sean, that's his brother. Now they're paying Archie Miller over $10 million to not coach. Yeah. But, you know, another thing is there's, there's a couple of universities that are like that. I mean, you know, UCLA, no, even though. They've won national championships or won a national championship since John Wooden left. Uh, it's not good enough. They were, you know, Indiana's that way. Um, those are legendary programs. Um, Kentucky used to be that way in a lot of cases. But, I mean, they were lucky because Rick Pitino was there for a while, and then Calipari comes in the door. Uh, Tubby Smith was there. So they were able to win and get established again. But for a while, they, were, they, were, they had a university like that. I mean – it's tough, these blue bloods, and especially for some reason, UCLA in Indiana, um, UCLA is, is, has been a longer run, you know, run with coaches, but uh, Indiana, uh, they can't seem to find the right coach and come in there and reestablish that legendary position. You know what I mean? I yeah, know. I, mean, I mean, are they giving anyone a chance? I mean, it, sometimes, especially when you take over and the program's in, in a rough shape, it takes a while, and the patience is just not there anymore. We know that. We live this uh, sports life every day, and we see coaches, you know, getting the boot, um, you know, after a year sometimes now. So, um, you know, they're not the only place doing that, but it's just hard to reestablish yourself as a as a dominant program when you can't even have any consistency at the top. But you know, I can't feel sorry for these coaches either because. No. These coaches like Archie Miller leaves Dayton. You know what I mean? Um, Shaka Smart leaves VCU. They put these these smaller programs on the map, and the minute a big program dangles a little bit of money and a little bit of fame in their mouths, they 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 don't care about the guys and the kids they're leaving behind. They go for the greener pastures, and you know they grab the money, so they get screwed in the long run. I can't feel sorry for them. I no, mean, I mean, you better, if you're going to jump shark and go for the cash, you better win because guess what? If they're paying you all that money and you're making the NIT, you're going to be uh, looking for a small college job again real soon. And this is the thing that, that gets you when you sit there and you go, why do these coaches cheat? Why? Because they have to cheat. I mean, yeah. I mean okay, you know, why did they do this? Why did they do that? Well, because they have to get the blue bloods that they can use to keep them their programs on top because otherwise they're going to get fired. And go and have to go shop for another job again. I mean, it's the eternal cycle, and, and, and nobody's, it's like nobody is innocent in this game. I don't care if it's the broadcasters who build these guys up to be geniuses. I don't care if it's the universities who pay them all this money and let them run their programs with autonomy until they get caught. Then, oh, nobody knew what was going on, and all this other crap that goes on. And we're all involved in it, and everybody pretends to go, oh, I never knew that was happening. Come on. How did he get the, the six best recruits to come to his university? Please. Yeah, they, they, they pay the piper. I mean, that's it's been going on for forever. And to sit here and act like you don't think that some of these guys are getting paid and that there's not backdoor deals between parents, between AAU coaches, between high school coaches – 
there's people getting greased all over the place to get these guys to come. And now it's going to be even tougher because of all the other options that we talked about, the, this new league starting up, uh, yep. you know, the, the G League option, going to Italy, going to France, going to Lithuania, going to Australia. Plus, hell, a lot of these guys, they sign with an agent right away, and they're just doing their own thing and training for a year. So, <laughs> you know, they, they got to they got to grease the wheels somehow to get them to come uh, to the campuses because a lot of these kids don't care about the education anymore. It's not part of it. I mean, would you be shocked if, if the there was a rumor that uh, the Indiana AD was hanging out in Westchester County right now waiting for uh, Alabama to send Iona packing on, on Friday? I would not be shocked. I would not be shocked. <laughs> as I told you, as I told you last week, I wouldn't be shocked if they, after the tournament uh, run is over that we hear that Patino's going somewhere because, you know, yeah. he's not afraid to uh, fall in the trash. No, he, and he's not afraid. To, he's one guy you know that wherever he goes, he seems to be able to, to redo the, the whole program. He's one guy that you got to say will put that team right, right away. I mean. Oh, would I want him as my coach? Oh, yeah. I would bring him in today if I was starting up a, a program and needed somebody. But you got to remember, you better pay the man because he's got to cover the cost of all his girlfriends and the suits and all the, you know, hangers on, all the cars. It, it's. He's got expenses, so you remember. And the other thing is, he liked the he liked being out in Kentucky because uh, you know he's a big horse racing guy. Indiana's not that far away, you know what I mean? That's that's horse country too. So he could he could have his farm where he's raising his horses in the off season and getting ready for Syracuse or not Syracuse for uh, upstate New York, uh, you know, if he wants to. So there you go. All right, well, let's do some quick because we got Steve. Like I said, he's coming up in about fourteen minutes. But um, NCAA breakdown, first of all, the first day, the, the play-in four, uh, when would you ever think that Michigan State and UCLA would be in that group? Uh, this year, because, uh, <laughs> I mean, half of the Blue Bloods, can t- I mean, we got a, we got a, a 68-field team uh, bracket with no Duke and no Kentucky. Yeah. So and no Indiana and no any of these teams. So to see UCLA, a lot of people didn't think that uh, Michigan State would make it with their 15 and 12 record. Um, they've got some pretty big quadrant one wins. I guess that's how they, you know, they, their RPI is pretty high uh, yeah. due to some of the teams they beat. That victory against Ohio State was definitely the difference maker, and that got them in uh, to the first, you know, final four in. And by the way, for anybody who wants to enter our bracket, uh, it's on our Facebook page. The safety and the sports writer, jump on in, but give us your entry. Uh, we're working on a prize uh, for the winner, and uh, we'll come up with something to do. And but actually, just get in there and, and give us your picks. We want to make this fun. Uh, it is our first year doing it, so we want to get some some people in there. We want to see who can come up with the best picks. Um, I, I I just scratched down some matchups that I think are intriguing in the first uh, two days. Florida against Vatek. I think that's going to be a, a good matchup, a seven against a ten. Um, Utah State, I wouldn't be surprised if they take out Texas Tech for some reason. Um, I'm very un- unhappy that Loyola has to play Georgia Tech. Um, I think Georgia Tech is going to ruin their their run. I don't think we're going to have another beautiful Loyola run to the Final Four. Uh, but Tennessee against Oregon State. Here's where I want to get your opinion. Tennessee, uh, you've been watching them all year. Oregon State, I don't know a lot about, but they are a Pac-12 team. Um, number 12 against number 5. That's kind of one of those upset combos, you know, the 5 against the 12. That's sometimes where the, where the upset comes out of. And Oregon State is not Valpo. It's not one of those teams. It's an established team. How do you like about Tennessee having to take them on in the first round? Uh, it makes me very, very nervous. Um, especially after, um, you know, Oregon State was able to beat Colorado and, and win the Pac-12 championship. I mean, uh, regardless of what you think about the Pac-12 this year, um, they were able to, to, to last, you know, out and win the, win the whole tournament. So I think Oregon State is playing their best basketball of the year right now. Uh, coming off that tournament win and Tennessee, uh, they make me nervous every game. I mean, uh, let's be honest. Since uh, SEC play started, um, they're seven and seven. So 
uh, that the, they've been inconsistent. One game they look great; they look like they could beat anybody in the uh, country, and then the next game uh, they their shots aren't going in, and and then they quit playing defense when their shots don't go in. And I, you know, it's got to be the opposite. When your shots don't go in, you need to play better on defense, <laughs> not quit playing defense. So you know, and then you know, the game the other night uh, they had a 15 point lead on Bama. Um, going into the second half, and to give that lead up, um, you know, it, it was just inexcusable. And I, I blame the coach. I blame the players. Um, you know, it, you can't do that. You can't. You can't just. First off, when you're up by 15, you can't let the other team go on a 14 point run and not call a timeout. I mean, I <laughs> after 10, stop the game. You know, and I just didn't understand that. And then to put Devonte Gaines in in the last. Uh, minute of the game, the last, you know, there's seconds left in the game and you put a guy in for defensive purposes who hasn't played all day. So what happens? He actually does decent on, on defense and stops uh, Perry from scoring, but then Perry just grabs him and fouls him on purpose. So that he has to shoot two free throws of which he's a 50% shooter and he hasn't, you know, been off the bench all day and he misses them both. And that's your ball game. And then, uh, then we have UNC against uh, Wisconsin on, on an opening night. I mean, that that's usually a semifinal or a Sweet Sixteen game, uh, but this year, of course, it's not. I I like UNC in this game. I think they're starting to play their best ball game, and I don't think I don't think this is your your father's Wisconsin team. I think uh, Wisconsin got through on a down year, and I think they're going to go out very fast against North Carolina. Um, but next next one intrigued me is Clemson Rutgers because this has not been a good ACC year and Rutgers. I like that Rutgers team. I like their chances of taking out Clemson in the first round. What do you think about that? Mix, that match yeah. I, I, this is not the year of, um, of the ACC. I mean, that's just the facts. I, I'm, I haven't been impressed with them. Uh, if you look at the, the, the championship game, I mean, it was uh, basically Georgia tech, by default uh, with Florida state, not even really showing up in the championship game. And I, I, I agree with you. I've been pretty impressed with Rutgers. They kind of came out of nowhere. And um, I've really, if I had to pick this game, I would take, uh, I would take Rutgers over them uh, just because I, I don't believe in the, the conference itself um, this year. And I, the big 10 has been so tough. And um, Rutgers has weathered the storm in the Big Ten. I mean, they were 15 and 11, and um, hell, they got Ron Harper Jr. So uh, that's that's one thing they got. You know, his dad was pretty damn good for a long time. So next next one I'm looking at is something that it opens up to both of us. Don't like this team, don't like the coach, but I'm thinking Syracuse. Syracuse can go a long way in this tournament if you look at at their bracket. They're part of the bracket. San Diego State to start out with. Um, they've been playing better ball lately, and I forget who they play after San Diego State, but I can see them actually making it to a regional final. How weak they are, the 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 bracket they're in. Yeah, they and, play. Um, Syracuse plays San Diego State in the first round, which San Diego State's twenty three and four. And I actually thought that the six seed, um, you know, I I thought they might get a little bit higher. Although some people said that was too high for them, I, I thought they, you know, twenty three and four is a pretty good year. And then you know, if Syracuse were to win, uh, they would have to play the the winner of West Virginia Moorhead State. And Virginia, and, West Virginia's playing like crap right now. Right, West Virginia's been slumping, so I could see uh, the winner of that uh, of that San Diego State Syracuse game moving on. Yeah, uh, another another one that day is Nova against Winthrop now. I wouldn't even mention this in a normal year, but of course, if Nova had his two guards, they probably would be a one seed. Um, but being a five seed against Winthrop, without their starting guards, they should be able to get past Winthrop, you would think. But that's another 5-12 situation, and I don't know what to think about that game. Yeah, I don't either. Winthrop's 23-1. and one. So it's, and you know, Winthrop's been in this tournament before. Um, has at least a couple of victories, so I think they'll play them tough, and uh, that'll be a that'll be a tough, scrappy first round game. I expect Villanova to win, um, but it's going to take all everything they got. And if they do get by them, uh, they have to play the winner of Purdue North Texas, which I expect to be Purdue. And um, I've got Purdue winning that game against Nova. Well, we're trying to get Aaron Wheeler, a player on Purdue, for later on in the week. I'm working on that right now. Um, Colorado G Tech. Or uh, Georgetown, I'm talking about Georgetown, Colorado, Georgetown. 
Um, you know, Georgetown won the Big East, but can they carry it over? I mean, they're another 5-12 situation. What do you think about that game? You know, I don't know. I, I didn't really expect uh, Georgetown to win the Big East, so yeah. I can't sit here and say that I knew that Georgetown could do it because I, I didn't think they could. I, I expected them to be an early exit, so uh, it was a great job by Patrick Ewing. you got to give him credit. I bet they know who, who the hell he is now uh, trying to get into the MSG. I mean – First off, that guy should be fired for not knowing who the hell. That's me on the wall. That's you me in the rafters. Yeah, they're like, well, sir, you need to have a pass. He goes, my pass is right up there in the rafters, uh, number 33. Yeah. And seriously, if you don't know who Pat Ewing is and you work at the Garden, somebody should tell you who Pat Ewing is and be like, this guy's okay. Uh, exactly. but it pissed off Patrick Ewing enough to make sure his team won, and kudos to Georgetown. But I don't know if the magic will last. I mean, time is going by. Here they're having several days of rest, and due to that fact, um, I'm going to go with the Buffaloes. I know they lost in the Pac-12 championship to Oregon State, but they made it there, and uh, they've had a pretty good season. So I'm going with the Buffaloes. We're going past the. I'm going to go past this one really quickly. I mean, LSU. I think they did them a favor giving them St. Bonnie's in the opening round. Eight. That's a little bit high for the Bonnie's, I think, at nine. But again, it's a COVID. That's a COVID uh, ranking. I think that they, LSU. I think that's a favor to give them that. Then you got Bama against Iona. I'm just mentioning because of the Pitino effect. I, I have Bama going all the way to the Final Four. Uh, I love what I've seen about them lately. and um, it, it, But it's fun to have Pitino back in the tournament. I don't care. Hate him, love him. You know, people, I understand he's sanctimonious when he comes out and says stuff. But all they, they all are. I still say, give me Rick Pitino and almost any starting five in America, and I'll take my chances with him. Yeah, uh, no, and I agree with you. As I've said, he's an unbelievable coach, but I've watched this Alabama team all year long, and this Alabama team, even even in the um, game against Tennessee when they were struggling, to, they couldn't hit a three-pointer to save their life. Uh, their best player had two points, and they were down by 15. It didn't really feel like they were out of the game, and obviously right. they weren't. Um, you know, they came back and won it, but I'm just saying, even when their chips were down – and everything was, um, you know, not going in their way, and all the momentum was against them, um, you know, they still came back and, and were able to win that game. They've got several guys that can score. Uh, Shackelford, obviously Herbert Jones, SEC Player of the Year. Um, you know, he can do everything. And then they've got John Petty, and uh, hopefully Primo will be back from injury. I don't know if he will, um, but if they can get Primo back too, uh, I can see this team going to the Final Four. In fact, I'm picking them too. And then we got UConn against Maryland, another opening game. Uh, no favor for UConn here. I think Maryland's going to give them a tough time. Um, a number seven against a number 10. Um, I was hoping UConn would get maybe kind of a, you know, on a weak, weak sister, but I mean, it would be nice to not have to face a team this, this type of Maryland. What do you think about this one? Yeah, I think it's a tough, that's a tough draw for, for UConn. Um, you know, first time back in the tournament in a while. Uh, everybody was fired up, and that's that's a tough opening game. I know I'm down on the ACC this year, but um, still Maryland is uh, uh, capable of, of, of knocking the Huskies off. Yeah. And then uh, well, Maryland's on the ACC. They're in Big Ten. Yeah, that's true. I am well, high on the Big Ten. Yeah, they, they played – that was the best, the, the best conference in basketball. I agree. Oklahoma-Missouri, an 8-9 game. Um this is another going where you'd look at it and you go, usually you go, these two teams shouldn't be make shouldn't be playing till next week. But they are playing opening. One of the, we're gonna lose a, one of the top top teams. Um I hear a lot of people are jumping off the sooner bandwagon and calling them a fraud. And I know you've been high in Missouri for the last couple of weeks. Uh would you go with, with Missouri on this one, the Tigers? Yeah, I am, and that's because I like Missouri, man. I mean, I, I really like their guards. Drew Smith and Pinson uh, are two guards that both average 14.1 points. And then they've got uh, two pretty good big men, and uh, I like Jeremiah Tillman. He averages 12.3 points and seven rebounds. So they've got the uh, big guys down low and the guards uh, to get it done, and, and they're you know fairly deep team. They go about eight or nine deep, and I, I expect them to win this one. All right. Well, we got Steve Balasari about ready to come on. I see him in the bullpen, so we'll bring him on with us. Uh, hold on one second. Steve, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight? 
I'm good. How are you guys? Doing really well. Doing really well. A lot of stuff going on. And uh, we were talking about free agency and football. We were talking about the NCAA tournament. So, you know, it's it's a good time. It's a good time right now uh, uh, to to get on with this. And you know, we brought you on to talk about the quarterback situations and what it's like to play quarterback in in college and things like that. And why don't we get right to it? When you see, uh, a, like right now, what's going on with the quarterbacks in the NFL? How much movement they're talking about and the, the replacement of it? Are you, does this year shock you? It seems like so many guys going to be relocating and stuff. No, it's hard to say. I think uh, the last year Yeah, Steve, I think we're having a mic problem uh, with you there. Can, can you get me any closer to the mic? Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, when, uh, when I didn't really hear what you said about the, the relocating of the, of the quarterbacks, but what, what if you could just repeat what you said a little, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, still have a little problem in picking up what you're saying. Um, anyway, get this on the what? Yes, you got a if you got a maybe some earbuds that would work. How's that? Ah, that, that's good. There you go. I have I a mic and it was using my default mic. Well, sorry about that. Oh, you're good. That's you're okay. Good. That's okay. As long as we can hear you, so. All right, so yeah, so yeah, I mean, the NFL, you, you said it, 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 it goes on every year and stuff. It, it, it was just the way that, that things are today, it just seemed that when, with the rumors going around, this guy's going here, this guy's going there, we don't know where Deshaun Watson's going to be. It kind of, as a fan, it leaves you up in the air. You're wondering, well, who am I going to be rooting for? It's kind of, it's kind of hard, but yeah, I mean, you understand because you've been through the business of it. Um, yeah. So go on. Well, well, a little bit of what you were saying about it. No, I was talking more about the evolution of quarterbacks and the need to be mobile. Um, and if you look at kind of the legends that have been playing the game, right? You've had Brady, you've got Drew Brees and others that are starting to retire and you got this new guard coming in and the NFL is changing, right? So there's a lot of moving pieces and quarterback. There's not a, I hate to say it, but there's not a ton of guys that you could just plug and play and go win football games with, right? So they're challenged at finding people that can actually go move the needle. Oh. Yeah, no doubt. It's uh, first off, it's great to hear your voice, Steve, and great to see you, man. We appreciate you coming on, and I, I agree with you 100. percent I mean, uh, with the uh, retirement of Drew Brees today, it's it's a new era, and um, you know we're seeing Lamar Jackson, uh, we're seeing Pat Mahomes. I mean, he's more of a pocket passer, but Pat can run when he has to, and um, you know Justin Fields, um, mm -hmm. you know he's he's a dual threat guy, so. You know, I just want to get your thoughts on on these dual threat quarterbacks. Jalen Hurts is another great example who will probably be starting for the Eagles. You know, get your thoughts on them, um, you know, taking over in the NFL and, and maybe the offense is changing a little bit um, from what they've been in the past. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier before the mic was messing up. Um, you've seen defenses evolve to where they have so much speed at every position. And the fact that we have defensive ends running four threes is uncomfortable, right? Um, so to be able to play that position and do it effectively as a quarterback, you have to be mobile. Um, I think Tom Brady is one of the few guys that doesn't move around a lot that's really effective. Um, but they do a good job pre-snap and getting the mismatches and things they want. But, you know, you hit the nail on the head. Mahomes is more mobile than people give him credit for. And he only uses it when he needs to, which is why he'll probably have a really long career. But that position's changed. And I, if I look at the offenses that have been set up in, in college. Um, they're exploiting that, and that's kind of transitioning to the NFL. We'll see how long it lasts, though. If there's one thing I do know with uh, defensives in the NFL, they're really good at finding ways to stop that. And case in point, look what happened in the Super Bowl. So, yeah. 
Well, is, is it an extension of the spread formations that's become such a so prevalent that it makes sense to have a quarterback because he can he can pick and choose his holes and stuff? Is that some of the things that's gone into the evolution of using the running quarterback or the dual threat quarterback more? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, if you look at the college level, why the spread is so effective, and if you go back in history and look at Oregon when they started it, it was really to get mismatches for running the ball, right? They didn't have big offensive linemen like we did and allow them to get to the second and third level um, with their athletes. Now, fast forward, they're doing that with, you know, wide receivers in space and just trying to find the mismatches. And you can do that in college pretty easily. I mean, look at the Ohio State, Alabama game. They found our mismatches and they exploited it. Um, in the NFL, finding those mismatches with the spread becomes a lot more challenging, right? Because you have a lot better athletes at every position across the board, but it's evolving that way, right? right. And so, the uh, emergence of big tight ends that are really athletic that create mismatch problems. Uh, I think that's a trend that's here to stay for a really long time. And that's going to continue to evolve with these quarterbacks that are athletic as well. Yeah, I, I agree with you hundred percent, Steve. I mean, if you think, um, you know, obviously getting Pat Mahomes in it, it, behind center is what has propelled Kansas city, but the staple with the chiefs has been Travis Kelsey. I mean, that guy is a nightmare to cover being a former defensive back. Uh, like you were at times in me, uh, you know, who's going to cover him? I mean, a safety can't really keep up with him and a corner, he just boxes them out. So, you know, what do you think about uh, the tight end and, and how they're doing it more as a guy that's a pass catcher uh, than an inline blocker? Well, it's funny you say KC because they started that with Tony Gonzalez, right? I mean, he kind of redefined that position and then it's evolved. And you look at the things that Kelsey's doing and then, I mean, there's a whole list of them. Right. I don't even know half of them because you look up and you see a six, seven tight end making catches and you can't cover him because he's running a four, four. Right. Um, that's a trend that just creates a big problem mismatch wise. And you start spreading it out and uh, getting people active. It's it's a recipe for problems. <laughs> you know, when you talk when you talk about the college level quarterbacks, you know what I always find it's kind of. It's counterintuitive in one part in my mind, but I mean, you played at a big university. And we see guys like going to Clemson, going to uh, Alabama, and waiting their turn. And and kind of the mindset of a quarterback for you, you could give me on this, because I always think go to a place where you know you're going to play. But I guess that goes against your instinct as a competitor. You think you're going to play wherever you go. You have that confidence in yourself. Is that the, what I don't see with that, the, the answer to that, that quandary of mine always? Well, the reality is, um, if you're going to a school like Ohio State, Alabama, Clemson, you're going to have to compete. And if they're going to sit, if you sit there and actually believe that you have, you're going to start for three years just because of what you've done previously, and they're not going to actively recruit the next best player, you're crazy, right? So, if anything, you should be going into that mindset like, I want to go compete. Like, I, I chose Ohio State because I knew I had the opportunity to try to start for three years, right? I looked at the rosters and. I had to go fight for that and earn that every year. And, you know, Craig Krenzel and others came out every year and they wanted to play too. And I think that's what makes these universities really well. Um, I don't believe there's a kid coming out that's highly recruited going, yeah, I'm going to wait my turn. It sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> um, no, they want to go out and compete. And that's why these universities are doing really well. What's made it really challenging though is this whole transfer portal rule and doesn't make sense in my mind. I think you got to give kids the right opportunity to play, but they got to be committed to something just like coaches do too. Right. I, I also, I hate the coaches that offer 78 kids when they have 22 scholarships. Right. Yeah, so right. there's a fine balance on both sides that we got to figure out, but um, it's really interesting. But the, the, the mindset is you go in to compete and uh, you want to go earn that job because that's how you get the respect of your teammates. Yeah, definitely. Steven. And, and these kids, they want to win, they want to win championships. I mean, I'm sure that was part of, um, you know, your decision making. Now you, you you'll know better than me, but um, you know, a lot of these top tier guys, they want to go somewhere where they're, you know, competing for a conference and competing for a national championship. And that is what me and Joe have been talking about. Um, you know, the last few months is some people are a little bored with college football now because it is the same teams. It is my Buckeyes, your Buckeyes. It is the the Bamas. It is the Clemsons. They're there every year. Do you think um, you think that's a trend that'll continue, and that these teams will keep doing it? Depending on the coaching, right? I mean, if you go back into the '90s, think about Florida State and Miami, right? Yeah. They were always a part of that conversation. I grew up in South Florida, so I, I heard it a lot. 
Um, and then, you know, Ohio State had its runs and so did Alabama. I would say if you look at what the SEC has done over the last, call it 10, 15 years, it's been pretty impressive. So I get the boring comment, but if you look at the way recruiting is being done and social media and kids have these abilities to go do different things and, you know, get scholarships early, I think there's always going to be a chance for that to change. I mean, Clemson has been probably the biggest surprise. Yeah. Um, they've always been a good program, but their dominance as of late has been really impressive. Yeah. Um, I think the tables turned a little bit this year, obviously, um, yeah. but we'll see. I mean, they still have a great group of kids coming back and what they're going to be able to do. And Coach Sweeney's a really good coach. So I think the coaches really make the difference in that more than anything else. I agree. And I, I don't think it's, I wasn't saying me. I don't think it's boring. I think it's great. I want to <laughs> win every year, man. I, keep I'm it up. Fan. Keep it up, you know. Thirteen wins a season. I'm cool with it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, and I don't want to put you on the spot to be critical of any coach, and but you know, as a Notre Dame fan, what I find incredible is they. I don't want to say they get good quarterbacks, but they don't seem to get that dominant quarterback that Trevor Lawrence. And I mean, Notre Dame's always on TV. Notre Dame's always going to, you know, if you're a Notre Dame quarterback, you automatically are kind of in the Heisman discussion just because you're a Notre Dame quarterback, or at least that's the way it used to be. You have um, your own network. <laughs> exactly. And, you right. know, it's like, I just can't get why they don't get that, that primo quarterback. I don't know if you have an opinion on it or whatever. I don't know. So, you know, coming out, I was recruited by Notre Dame. I really, I wanted to go there, actually. Um, Catholic kid, uh, that was something growing up watching it. But getting recruited there, there's different standards just from an academic stand standpoint. And, um, you know, say what you want. Kids go to college on a scholarship to play football. Yes, they will mm -hmm. get the degree. But the reality is those top tier guys want to make sure that post-college, education or not, they have that shot to play football, right? And, uh, yeah, Notre Dame's done a good job of putting out, you know, a lot of players in the NFL. But outside of Joe Montana, right, recently, they haven't had another quarterback go into the NFL and you can say the same for Ohio State, right? If you look at our positions, quarterback's not been the position that's like we're running people into the NFL and doing really well. When you look at defensively and offensive line and running backs, receiver, like we have a ton of those. But, you know, just if you think of going into the NFL, Ohio State and Notre Dame aren't the tops when it comes to that at times. Yeah, that, that was what I was going to ask you is if there's been a lot of great quarterbacks at Ohio State that I've seen, but – that none of them have really made that splash in the NFL. And I thought Haskins would be the one to do it. Um, and he still may. He's he's, yep. he's, not, he's at the right spot now with the Steelers. But what do you think is the main reason for that? I mean, JT Barrett, I thought he would be a great NFL quarterback too. And it hasn't worked out. Yeah, it's, it's tough, right? I mean, there's been a lot of quarterbacks, whether it's Ohio State or not, that have been highly touted and go in the NFL and don't make it. It's a different game. The speed of it is something that is just – it's hard to comprehend. And um, – you know, you, I, I can see it just because of my previous experience, but playing in college, you think it's fast. And then you get to the NFL and it's, it's, it's way different, right? And the ability to throw people open when they're covered, a lot of college kids don't have that coming out. So if you look historically, the ones that have gone into the NFL and been successful, they've had a chance to sit behind an Aaron Rodgers or Drew Brees and learn. Getting thrown in right away out of college, I'm trying to think in my recent memory, Who's been a quarterback that's come in highly touted and done extremely well? There's not many, right? So it takes a really special individual because you got to learn the game. It is a different game. As much as I, you know, you watch it and it seems, it seems similar, it's not. And um, I think that's probably the hardest part. So you look at Haskins, he got thrown in right away. And there were some moments that looked really good. And there were some moments where you're like, yeah, he's a rookie quarterback. Yeah. And um, that's where these franchises that draft a quarterback early – if their intentions to play him right away, that's tough. So it'll be really interesting watching Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence where they go and how that plays out. You know, I live in the New York area, and, and you know, we got two young quarterbacks right now that are, are pretty much in the air. Uh, you know, Daniel Jones is going to his third year. Sam um, Darnold might be on his way out of New York, uh, fair or unfair, however you want to make it look at it. And the, the thing, I, my perception is somebody who never played college ball, but I've always been a college fan, Sometimes a quarterback, you know, can be in a system surrounded by, you know, a lot of talent and you don't know how good he is. And then you got a quarterback who comes from like a Duke and Duke's only going to be, be as good as that quarterback is. Sure. Uh, I mean, 
it does it does that does that kind of stunt the way you look at a, at a quarterback? Maybe he's, it, it's the talent around him when he's at a USC or something like that. Whereas when he's coming out of a smaller college or something like Ben Roethlisberger out of Miami of Ohio, they're only going to win as many games as he can do it. Mm-hmm. Is it. Is it easier to judge that? Does it make sense what I was saying there? Yeah, I think it boils down to this, right? Um, most of these athletes that go to a major college that are Division One, you know, Trevor Lawrence, how many football games has he lost in his career? One, two? Yeah, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> the mental psyche of going into the NFL and being humbled, it's pretty different. <laughs> You're better off from seeing how they deal with adversity in the games they've lost versus the games they've won, right? And that's where you understand, like a Ben Roethlisberger, he learned how to take his lumps, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes going to the NFL, I don't care who you are, how good you are, you're going to take your lumps when you go in the NFL. That is just a, a fact of life. And um, so that's where it becomes really interesting is their ability to get basically beat up, and come back and see what happens. Um, Patrick Mahomes, it's going to be a really interesting year for him, right? That 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 Super Bowl, they got exposed. That defense got after him, put him on his heels. Played, I mean, he gave it all he got, and he took a lot of shots. But now he's got to come back after losing a Super Bowl and do it again. Yeah, and it'll be a really big year for him. And that, I'm more than confident he'll do it. But you've seen other. I mean, look at uh, San Francisco, right? They got beaten Super Bowl two years ago. They didn't show up this year, and Garoppolo was a different guy because that that part of the game, that mental aspect is. That's the biggest part, and that's what separates the top tier quarterbacks. I, I I agree 100. percent And and with the mental aspect of it, I've got to imagine that the you know the patience factor has to weigh on these kids too. I mean, we were just talking about Haskins is a great example. You know, he finally was the starter. You know, named the starter this year at the beginning of the season. He started four games and got yanked. I mean, when did four games become the barometer for telling whether or not a guy can do it or not? I mean, you got to think that the patience factor has got to be in their heads. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. But I mean, you live in New York, right? Four games. And that's not a, it's a trial. <laughs> they don't want to wait for it. Right. They don't care. Yeah. They yeah. want to win now. Yeah. And um, you know, that's why it's a big boy game and you're getting paid. You're a professional and you better take those lumps and deal with it. Right. So it's tough. Yeah. Um, if he earns that job, he's got to go in, you know, guns a blaze and win football games. If not, Four games is almost about right, right? Because yeah. that coach is going to get fired too. It, that's the inevitability in the NFL that I don't think the general public understands. Like everyone gets fired. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At some point you get told you're not good at your job. Well, right? And they're always they're always looking to replace you. No matter how good you're doing, they're looking for somebody cheaper uh, to take your spot, even if you're good. Yeah, they did it in New England with Tom Brady. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't matter who you are. That day will come. <laughs> and you know, and with, as an athlete, you know, Father Time is the only uh, the only person that's undefeated. You know, no so uh, when you you know back to when you were talking about the quarterbacks recovering from Super Bowl losses, um, you know, even what you talked about, the Rams gave up on their quarterback already. Um, I can only think of like John Elway is the only one I can think about that lost the Super Bowl and actually came back to win a couple. Yeah, right. So that is the that quarterback is, that in my mind that. Just he still was an amazing player, regardless. It was Jim Kelly, right? He had yeah. tough losses, but I mean, every year he got back there. He, yeah. But and, you know, he he's a different breed in my mind for him, his ability to handle that, right? But um, there's not been a lot of quarterbacks that can do that. No, no, you can keep the team on, on the even keel and everything. When you look at um, the the NFL, uh, what we what we saw this year with COVID and everything that's going on in the off season. Uh, what what kind of grade would you give the uh, the NFL for what what they put on? I mean, they got every game in. They didn't. There was no major losses because of COVID. Were you surprised they were able to get through it without anything really happening with that virus and stuff? I'm, I'm I was pleased. Um, I wouldn't say surprised. I think uh, you, know, you got a group of men that are professionals that are paid to do a job, and, and they they did that. Um, you know, you had your mishaps along the way, and some people made some mistakes and I was pretty public, but for the most part, I wasn't surprised. Uh, a lot of those guys knows what they know what's on the line. They know what is required of them and it's their lifeblood. And if you take it serious and you're going to play well, like I, I wasn't too surprised. I, w- I was thankful actually, because there's so much unpredictability and it goes not just to the players, but to the organization and everyone that touches it. It's a type of virus that if you don't pay attention to can spread very quickly. So I, 
the measures and the protocols they put in place, I thought they did a really good job. Yeah, uh, we I agree, uh, Steve. And we, we've been talking for weeks now about, you know, the situation due to the pandemic, um, the caps coming down. And this is the first time ever in the NFL history where the the cap is not going up by a 10, 20 percent. It's coming down and there's teams uh, I've been going over at nonstop teams that are struggling to get down uh, just you know out of the red. And um, with that said, there are going to be players cut uh, like never before. Um, there's going to be different situations. And, and we really are putting a premium on this draft. I mean, there, there's teams that are going to have to start rookies because that's the only guys they can afford. And so these, these rookie quarterbacks, it's going to be imperative that you get the right one. You started at quarterback at Ohio State. What do you think of Justin Fields? Do you, you think he can make it? I do. I think he's got all the tools. I think – um, you know, that speed of the game, that's where it'll get interesting. And um, it's hard to predict. Everyone's going to react differently to that and what it looks like. Um, you know, depending on the system and, and the, the guys around them, I think that has a lot to do with the quarterback position too. Uh, there's a reason why Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, um, Aaron Rodgers are the tops. They know how to get their players in position to do well and, and win football games. And they put them in those positions. That is something that I did not understand coming out of college, right? I was athletic. I can go do it on my own. And so you kind of know it's counterintuitive. You have to fight that ability to be that good athlete that you are and let your playmakers make plays, get the ball to them and, and get, get out of the way, actually. Yeah. And, you know, you look at Baker Mayfield. It's taken him a little while to get to understand that, right? And you looked at the back half of the Brown season, they were clicking. And it wasn't about Baker Mayfield. It was about him getting the ball to people and getting out of the way. So if you look at Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence, you know, can they adjust to the speed of the game and then be comfortable letting their playmakers make plays? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think he can do it. I mean, look what, what he's done since he's been there. You know more than anyone, there's there's unamountable pressure to win at Ohio State. I mean, if you lose one game, there's the idiot fans that are just like, oh, God, here we go, you know, and and freak out after, after one loss. And, um, you know, he knew that and he wanted to be there. And I just think he's done a tremendous job handling that pressure and performing. And uh, that's why I give him, um, you know, that's why I give him a good shot because not only has he handled the pressure, but he's excelled. And he's a guy that can run when he has to, but in my mind, he also can throw. I mean, you've got to be somewhat impressed with his arm, right? Oh, absolutely. He's got all the intangibles, no, no doubt. I think, um, you know, that mental, that mental part of the game, and if he gets put in the right system with the right mentor – um, there's no doubt in my mind he'll, he'll make it. That, that is I, any of the quarterbacks right now. But if I look at, you know, last uh, seven, eight quarterbacks that come out of Ohio State, in my mind, Justin Fields has the most ability at that position going into next year from passing to running to, to, to all of it. I think he's really talented. Speaking of, uh, I mean, a line of ex-Ohio State legends, uh, Urban Meyer stepping back into the coaching. I mean, we've seen coaches like – even Nick Saban had problems in the pros. Steve Spurrier had problems in the pros. Uh, what do you think about Urban Meyer going in and uh, taking on Jacksonville? You know, I think he's walking into a unique situation. Um, you know, if, if, if I look back in history and try to think about why those guys didn't make it in the NFL, um, college football coaches are like CEOs, right? They're in charge of everything. Yeah. And in college, you have a lot more control because you have kids. They're amateurs, right? Yeah. You can hold education over their head. Um, in the NFL, you're going to have half your team making more money than you. Um, right? That's just a reality. And in college, the coach can say jump, and a lot will say how high. In the NFL, will be like, I don't want to do that today. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm already getting paid. Um, maybe we should do it this way. So if he has the ability to come in and learn – um, how to manage that with the players, right? Because it's just a different dynamic. And, you know, if you look at Nick Saban prior to going to the NFL and coming back, look how much better control he's had as of late and what he's been able to do because of what he learned in the NFL. Yeah. So there's something to be said for that. And I think, um, you know, Urban's a really smart guy and he's talented um, and he's a player's coach, which that's what you need in the NFL. So it'll, I think he's got a good shot at it. Um, it'll be curious how they do in the draft and, what pieces they get to plug in to help them out, but it'll be fun to watch nonetheless. 
I, I agree. I mean, let's be honest, even back in the day when, when me and you were in school, he was winning at Bowling Green, yeah. um, you know, and then he took the show on the road and, and won out in Utah. The guy's won everywhere he's ever been. And th I understand this is a different animal, but he's been pretty good about delegating in the past. Um, in my yeah. opinion, he, he's been able to, you know, get, get rid of the offense. I mean, he still has his hands in it, but he lets his coaches coach. And I think that's could be his good shot, but it has to help him uh, to be able to uh, go grab Trevor Lawrence, number one, right? It wouldn't hurt. <laughs> wouldn't hurt. Um, yeah, he's definitely got that ability. I mean, Urban, you, you leave in Ohio State, uh, University of Florida, to where he got it. I mean, I think he understands the pressure and, and what goes into it. And he's seen a lot of different athletes around a lot of different walks of life. So I think he's, he'll be able to jump in. But you throw a guy like Trevor Lawrence in, who's a winner as well, um, you're starting to get the right recipe for, for success. Yeah. And they've got uh, they're actually one of the few teams that has cap space. So a lot of these guys uh, that, you know, aren't going to get money other places. You know, I understand Jacksonville might not be the most attractive, uh, you know, sp destination for some of these free agents, but it's maybe the only destination for some of these guys, considering they have money to spend. So I think that'll help him too, being able to, to put a team around that guy. Yeah, it definitely won't hurt. And uh, there's a lot worse places to live than Jacksonville, Florida. So I would go there today. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Minneapolis right now, and it's Are you? five inches of snow on the ground. So I, I'll take Jacksonville any day. It's, <laughs> it's far, far removed from Boca, isn't it? Yeah, very far, very far. Why did you get? What are you doing these days, Steve? By the way, what are you? What are you, what are you doing? Yeah, so I work for a company called Intuitive, and um, it's a medical device, and I sell the Da Vinci robot. Um, okay. The robot, robotic assisted surgery, and uh, been doing that for two years. I was with Stryker Medical before that uh, for about ten years. So been a medical device, and uh, when I can, I try to coach my kids sports on the weekends. So sweet about it. Your brother's in the medical field too, isn't he? Yep, he's an orthopedic surgeon. So he's yeah. the team doctor for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, yeah, he he operated on my uncle. There you go. <laughs> yeah, he's got a great he practice. Too, he's walking around, so. Man, that's a plus. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you look back over playing quarterback at the level you did, I mean, you played at a high level. What kind of advice would you give kids, a high school kid who maybe you know is listening in tonight or anything, about developing themselves? Is there any kind of keys you can give them, or what what kind of advice would you give to a quarterback? Play other sports. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm I'm serious. If you go look across the NFL at some of the best players. They never specialized, right? And I and I say that back to the whole learning to lose, right? Um, I loved basketball. I probably wasn't great at it, and I struggled. But on football, I excelled, right? So you take those learnings of what's not working, how do I get better, and apply that to football, and you got a good recipe. So I, I think that's part of it. And then you know the other piece is we've done a really bad job getting back to fundamentals for kids, right? They see the NBA, they see sports center and all these big plays and it's all great, but they, they, they totally gloss over the, the fundamentals that go into it. I mean, Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes, when he can go make a throw sidearm, it's not because that's how he does it all the time. It's because he's worked really hard to get to that point. He's trained his body. He knows himself physically uh, to get there. Right? So, sometimes we fast forward to that end result versus taking the time to put in the work to just do the little things right. Um, so you go back to coach Wooden, right? And I like to read books and he started every year, people tying their shoes, start with the basics, right? So get really good with that. And then you can go on other things and then play other sports, right? Get perspective, lose, be bad at something. And that's okay. Right. There's, I've seen a lot of kids going to college that were the number one in their state. And then they go to Ohio state or in Alabama and, they're not even the top hundred on their team, right? Um, because you're surrounded by a, it's a bigger pool that you're fishing in. So that would be my advice for the younger kids is don't get too specialized. You're going to have plenty of time to dial into one sport. If you're good enough, go experience a lot and learn. All right. Hey, Steve, thank you very much for coming on. We'd love to have you on again, uh, maybe yeah. around draft time. Yeah. Be glad to do it. I'll make sure the mic works this time. <laughs> <laughs> you came through great once we got the mic set. Steve, yeah, no. pleasure. Steve, and, and you, glad to continue to discuss with your uh, post-athletic uh, career. I hope it, it keeps going on well, and we'll see you uh, back around draft time. All right. Sounds good, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Steve. 
Well, that was Steve Balisari, former standout quarterback at Ohio State. He had a lot of a lot of good things to say, and I, I like wrapping it up there what he had to say to kids because it is true. I mean, I see it around here. I saw it when I was covering high school sports around here. Kids stopping, not playing other sports, and uh, you know, not doing the things they got to do and enjoy. And like he says. It, it's it's great when you can learn how to improve yourself and not be great at everything. Yeah. No, and he's a testament to it, man. I remember, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that were worried about a, a dual threat uh, quarterback, you know, after Bobby Hoeing and Joe Germain and those pocket oh. pass guys. And, um, you know, Steve, uh, he persevered and, uh, you know, ended up having a very successful career because he – you know, he didn't listen to that noise and he he focused on what he needed to do and uh, always respected him for that and always loved uh, watching him play. I was a fan of his, too. I was a fan. Of, like, the, like I said, I remember him and I think it was Zach Mills was at around the same time. It, uh, maybe Zach right Mills after. was earlier. But uh, lefty quarterbacks, something, something about the way they throw. They have, I always like Jim Zorn and uh, Kenny Stabler, too. Yeah. So, uh uh, any other uh, thoughts on the NCAA tonight? Any game? Uh, we we talked about a few games. We we can. I think it's going to be a pretty good first two days of the, of the NCAA tournament. Um, you want to announce who your final four is right now? Have you gotten your final four? I mean, I don't. Um, I've got a quasi final four, just kind of you know, to, at a first glance. Um, I, I talked to uh, Keith. Our, uh, our our friend at the North uh, Northeast Stream and Sports Network, and um, I just kind of threw out a uh, just kind of quasi you know off the cuff uh, Final Four, and I picked Gonzaga, I picked Alabama, I picked Illinois, and then I picked UNC, and um, you know I don't know whether those teams will do it, uh, but. I, I just just glancing at it quickly. Those were the teams that I kind of saw coming out. I mean, you have to like what you've seen out of Illinois, right? I mean, oh yeah, they've got great guards. They have the big guy down low. They play defense. I mean, that's the thing with Illinois. They can score and they can get stops. And if you can score and get stops in this tournament, you can go a long way. Well, I um, I, there. I have only one change in my final four with the ones you got. I put Baylor in it. Yeah, uh, but uh, well, I mean, that, Baylor's had a great year, and they they could easily, um, you know, come out of that bracket. I just picked North Carolina because you're going to have upsets, right? Like somebody's going to beat somebody uh, at some point. You're not going to have all just scratch, and uh, that was kind of my one pick because I've seen UNC at their best. Um, but you know, the ACC has been a little bit down this year, and that could that could affect them. But I, you know, Baylor just lost. Uh, to Oklahoma State, so they're not invincible, and um, UNC's got the horses to compete with them, in my opinion. Well, my finals is the Zags against the Illini, so... Uh, okay, so you like Illinois, too. Oh, yeah, I love Illinois. Illinois and Alabama have been, uh, for the last three weeks, they're the best teams I've seen. Yeah. I, I just think they've got the it factor you're always talking about. Like you said, Alabama behind by 15, and it seems like a tie. Yeah. And you know Illinois, we, you know at any time that even it, it just seemed like they toy with teams. Sometimes they let them get close, and all of a sudden now we'll go out there again. Yeah, that's the thing with those two teams, with Illinois and Alabama, they can get behind and still come back because they can both shoot uh, the three ball. And like I said, both those teams can defend. So they can rebound. Stops. You're never going to come climb your way, scratch, claw, fight your way back into a game if you can't stop the other team from scoring because right. you'll never close the gap. And those two teams can do it. And the other thing is the boards, the rebounding. I okay. mean, if you can get yourself second shots, if yeah. you can eliminate the second shots for your opponent, I mean, you're you're far on the way to victory. So uh, it, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. I'm working to see if we get Aaron Wheeler. We'll try and get him in here for Thursday night. Um, we had a great, uh, Steve Belsar, it was a great, uh, guest tonight and we, you know, we're on a streak on Mondays. We got to start getting a Thursday guest in here and, uh, hopefully we'll have Aaron Wheeler and we'll, we'll uh, be back on Thursday night. People remember on our Facebook page, we have a link to join our bracket. We'd love to get as many people involved as possible and, uh, have a fun time with the NCAA tournament. It always makes a great month of March when we can get people, you know, looking at their brackets. Yeah, no, no. I, I think it's fun, man. I, I, um, I got away from it for a while just because it's so crazy. You know, I wanted to enjoy the games, but this year 
um, why not? You know, fill a bracket out, come to our Facebook page, um, just participate, man. It'll be fun. Uh, the winner will get something and also we'll get some bragging rights. So go fill one out. Take take five minutes, uh, fill a bracket out and, and beat us. That's it. All right, Nate, I will see you on Thursday night. And uh, everybody else who tuned in, again, thanks, Steve Belisari, great, get, uh, great guest tonight. And we'll be back on Thursday night at the same time, The Safety and the Sports Rider with Knoxville Nate and Big Joe. See you guys later. All right, guys. Adios. See you, Joe. You're listening to The Safety and the Sports Writer on Northeast Streaming Sports.